Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to today's um, Leaders Initiative seminar. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I will be moderating things here on the back end. Um, I will be sending out um, a link to a Qualtrics evaluation at the end of this. So um, if you have time, please fill out the evaluation so we know what kind of topics and um, yeah, other talks you will be interested in learning about in the future. So today we have Dr. Sammy Barmada. He's going to be doing our presentation. Uh, Dr. Barmada is an associate professor of neurology at the University of Michigan. His research interests focus on RNA and protein metabolisms in ALS and frontal temporal dementia, combining basic biology with translational research and technology development. And without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Sammy Barbata. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get things rolling here. Um, all right. So... Rather than reading my email, people should be seeing slides right now. Is that right? Great. Okay. So um, since this is a, a rather um, intimate audience, uh, I think I'd rather keep it pretty informal. So if anything comes up, any questions, just um, raise your hand. I think Zoom actually has some um, facial or gesture recognition software so that um, if you have that turned on, you can actually just raise your hand or interrupt me or just ask questions. But um, it'd be great to keep this um, a little bit less um, strict. So I thought today that I'd talk about um, something new um, that we've been working on, still sort of getting our heads wrapped around what this means and connecting it to some of our previous work as well. So any uh, comments, suggestions, or opinions are of course, welcome. I'm going to be talking a lot about this condition, ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, I, even though most people knows, know this better as the, the ice bucket disease, I actually have a, a I, I like this condition because the name actually accurately describes the disease. It doesn't just have a, a, an eponym attached to it. So as we know, um, the the corticospinal tract or the motor system is primarily comprised of an upper motor neuron that extends from the motor cortex down to the spinal cord, where it synapses on a um, lower motor neuron that extends from the spinal cord out to the muscles. So the, the amyotrophic part of a ALS comes from the muscle atrophy that you see in this disease when you lose that upper motor neuron or your lower motor neuron. The muscle um, doesn't get its typical uh, support and it ends up dying and, and shrinking. And that's the atrophy that you see and in, uh, in Latin uh, called amyotrophy. Um, and then the, the other part of the name, the lateral sclerosis comes from the neuroanatomy. So the corticospinal tract is the, the connections between the, the cortex and the spine in the form of the upper motor neuron. And they run on the sides or the lateral aspects of the spinal cord. And this particular cross-section of the spinal cord is stained um, for white matter. And you can see that um, the, the spots that have the least white matter are the, the gray matter where all the cells are, but um, along the outside, there are these two white patches. And that's where the, the dropout of the upper motor neurons, that those axons comes from. So um, Jean Charcot named this disease in like the 1850s, I believe. Um, very accurately to reflect the loss of both upper and lower motor neurons that gives you the amyotrophy and the lateral sclerosis. That being said, there, there are many different presentations for ALS based on the um, what we see and diagnose as, as clinicians, leading many people to consider ALS to be kind of a, a garbage can of uh, conditions that just affect motor neurons. I tend to uh, think of this as one disease, however, just with many different um, presentations because uh, of many different reasons, uh, including the pathology of the disease, but also the, the genetics. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail now. So for, for a long time now, we've known of large families that um, uh, in which uh, some people develop ALS and strangely, uh, um, or, or not so strangely, um, in some of these same families, people develop FTD, 
And in some rare, uh, unfortunate people, they have both ALS and FTD. Um, this is a pedigree from um, one of the families that was followed by the NIH for many years and had chromosome nine linked ALS FTD. Um, and only recently was this, uh, well, recently I say within the past 12 years, um, linked to a mutation in a gene called C9 or F72. But uh, back when, you know, first started to become aware of these inherited forms of ALS, um, there are really only um, two genes, uh, SOD1 and ALS2. I, I throw MAPT on here because it, it, at the time, if you look at these papers, it was uh, associated with ALS, but now we know that it's really not. In any case, this only described about 20% of all familial cases, and because only 10% of ALS is familial, really only uh, attributed to 2%. But um, 10 years later, uh, we now know of over 30 different genes that are associated with ALS. Um, and now we can explain the large majority of disease that runs in families. And as a matter of fact, if, if you start testing um, people who have other uh, apparently sporadic ALS, meaning no family history, you find a lot of de novo mutations in these genes, actually in up to 15 to 20% of people with no family history. So um, I think the answer to the question depends on how hard you look. And um, as we learn more and more and start to sequence more, we're finding more uh, individual genes and combinations that can cause ALS. But now that we have enough of these genes, we can start to learn something from them, put them into different categories. Um, and so uh, if we do that for, for these genes, we find that at least functionally, they separate into a, a few well demarcated um, categories, including um, genes that are involved in uh, their products involved in protein turnover, um, RNA processing and RNA metabolism, uh, axonal transport, and then the function of mitochondria. I mentioned this one family um, with the mutations in uh, C9 or F72. Turns out that uh, is not um, an isolated example. There are many mutation, many of these genes that when mutated can lead to either ALS or FTD or both. And it's really made me and several other people consider ALS and FTD to be on a pathophysiological spectrum. So if the disease process affects your motor neurons, you end up with clinically what we diagnose as ALS. But if that same disease process affects other parts of your nervous system, perhaps those control behavior, personality, outwardly, clinically, you're diagnosed with FTD. But it could be the, the same underlying issue, just attacking different parts of the nervous system. And um, if you look at what that actual issue is, is uh, that we see the, these pathological changes, um, most of these mutations end up causing the accumulation of this RNA binding protein called TDP43, right? So about two thirds of these um, will cause TDP pathology. Mutations in the gene that encode TDP also cause this pathology, but even if it's not directly that gene, you still end up affecting TDP. So I, I kind of see this as a, as a funnel where all these different um, origins or etiologies really, you know, um, zoom in or narrow and, and uh, funnel down to TDP43. And then depending on which region of the nervous system TDP accumulates you, you end up with the um, relevant or, or appropriate symptoms uh, because of that. And it really does place TDP as a, at a central um, uh, level. There are a few of these genes that affect other uh, proteins, including FAS, uh, ubiquitin. Well, I mean, I mean, in this case, I think we just, we have no idea um, what the pathology is, but you see ubiquitin positive deposits. And then um, there's this outlier out here, SOD1. And ironically, um, SOD1 was the first mutation that was associated with familial ALS. Um, it's still one of the most common in, in certain parts of the world. And uh, because we've known about it since the 1980s, a lot of the research is most advanced on this. Um, I will say that um, just recently within the past, I guess, year, um, a medication called tofersin was recently approved specifically for the treatment of people with ALS due to SOD1 mutations. 
Tofersen is an antisense oligonucleotide um, that uh, targets SOD1. And it's, it's really gratifying to see that People receiving this medication, at least in the in the early clinical trials, they um, stop getting worse, and it's very rare, if ever, to see that in ALS. And and more more than that, these people are starting to regain some muscle strength. So um, I think this is potentially uh, a, a valid therapeutic strategy, at least in SOD one. And I, I'd love to see this sort of pan out in other contexts as well. But um, in terms of TDP, let's let's talk. I, I want to talk about more. Uh, talk about this a little bit more, uh, not just because it's my favorite protein, but because it's such a central part of the disease. So this is an example of normal TDP forty three staining in this section from the spinal cord, and in this one motor neuron that you see here, um, uh, TDP is nuclear. That's where we we tend to think it should be right in in unaffected cells and healthy cells. TDP is primarily nuclear although it probably shuttles in and out of the nucleus. Um, but in ALS um, and, and in frontal temporal dementia, very often you'll see uh, exclusion of that protein from the nucleus, so it's gone. And you see little punctate deposits um, elsewhere in the cytosol. Sometimes you see these very interesting net-like or skein-like deposits um, or a dense inclusion. Now, I mentioned that... Uh, this is common in ALS. Over 95% of people with ALS have this same pathological signature, to, regardless of the clinical presentation, right? So again, uh, um, that's what has part of what's made me a lumper rather than a splitter. Um, in terms of FTD, you see very similar TDP pathology in about 50% of frontotemporal dementia, right? So you have the nuclear clearing, you have these cytosolic inclusions, sometimes nuclear inclusions, and then these dystrophic uh, or neuritic inclusions. Um, and again, FTD is clinically distinct, and that's because this, what we think at least, it's connected to uh, these same pathologic changes in different parts of the brain and in different neuronal subtypes. So TDP is... Um, the transactive DNA and RNA response element binding protein of 43 kilodaltons. Um, it has, not surprisingly, a nuclear localization signal that typically um, makes it more concentrated in the nucleus. It has two RNA recognition motifs, which are important for its ability to bind RNA. And um, it has a low complexity or prion-like domain within the C-terminus um, that allows it to participate in phase transitions, which are likely to be important for its function as a splicing repressor. So we, uh, our, our group has spent a lot of time thinking about TDP, what it's doing, how it's involved in disease. Um, I think that the, the uh, what I'll, I'll just summarize a lot of work. Some of it is ours, many of it is not, much of it is not. The, the going thought is that um, there are two things that happen in ALS and FTD. You lose TDP from the nucleus. It's a really essential splicing factor, and it probably binds to and regulates about a third of all transcribed RNAs, which is a lot. And if you don't have it around, a lot of stuff happens, and, and there's a lot of cellular dysfunction and death. Um, and you can mimic a lot of that by knocking down TDP. Right? You see a whole bunch of changes in gene expression and um, a lot of toxicity that ensues from this. And, and that's led to this, I, I think, the, uh, what, what most people now see as the, the model is that you have TDP mislocalization, a lack of TDP splicing, and you end up with a lot of RNA misprocessing that leads to cell death. But what I'm going to talk about today I, I want to at least consider the possibility that um, we're looking at it backwards and that there can be some RNA misprocessing events that drive TDP from the nucleus and, and probably um, you know, act in sort of a, a positive feedback loop or, or a vicious cycle um, to accelerate um, pathologic changes. So this work, um, this at least idea, came from some work that we were doing um, on a, a type of RNA modification uh, 
called uh, uh, methylation. And this is specifically methylation at the uh, N6 residue of adenosine or M6A methylation. This is not like DNA methylation, which um, is probably important for gene regulation. This is specific methylation of uh, RNA itself, which, and, and it occurs on a very specific um, motif, which we call the Dirac motif. Um, and uh, it has a lot of impact on the fate of the RNA, we believe. So there's a whole complex of writers um, and that, that add the methyl groups. Uh, there's um, some proteins that are called erasers that probably are more like inhibitors. Um, they don't, at least in vitro, they can remove the methyl group, but in cells, they probably prevent it from going on in the first place. Um, and then there's the, the business end. So the reader proteins that recognize the M6A mark and, and uh, affect the fate of the RNA. And most of the time, methylated RNA is subject to degradation. So this is typically viewed as a pathway of mRNA surveillance. And through many reasons, we got involved or we got interested in this pathway in ALS. I'll sort of skip to the chase and, and say that we were able to work with um, Stephen Geltman and uh, Crystal Packett from the... Um, ALS repository and get some tissues from people with ALS. This is spinal cord um, from individuals with sporadic ALS or unaffected controls and look specifically at M6A modified RNA um, in these tissues um, using a, an array. And so we can compare methylated to non-methylated RNA in this array. And essentially what we're able to see is that uh, just unbiased, the, the ALS tissues look very different from the controls. Um, you can see this by hier hierarchical clustering as well. And if you did a volcano plot, um, you can see that uh, almost 40% of the uh, methylated sites that were included in the array showed an increase in methylation in ALS tissue. And I don't, you know, we're not trying to make any conclusions in terms of cause and effect, right? This is end stage tissue. Um, there's a lot of cell death that occurs here and neuroinflammation, um, but uh, another aspect that we didn't appreciate is all this RNA methylation. So this is detected by the array. Um, we also tried to follow this up by immunostaining for uh, using antibodies that recognize methylated RNA. And again, we could see that there's uh, more RNA methylation in um, ALS tissue. And really interesting from our perspective is that the RNA, the methylated RNA seemed to overlap in some cases with TDP pathology. And uh, through several studies, we, you know, this was confusing, but interesting to us because um, I, I don't think that TDP is one of these M6A reader proteins that recognizes methylated RNA. But at the same time, I think the methylation uh, makes the RNA more accessible to, to TDP binding, right? So this is something called an M6A switch, um, which really is a fancy term for, for unwinding the RNA. Um, but if you have a secondary structure that, that is sort of hiding the, the motif for TDP, if you then methylate in the vicinity and you're binding by these bona fide readers, that can uh, sort of unwind the structure and allow access uh, by TDP. But it really made us consider, like, what happens if this is the case, right? If you have RNA hypermethylation, all of a sudden you're creating a whole slew of new targets for TDP that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. And is it possible that that is pulling TDP out of the nucleus um, rather than TDP moving first and messing up RNA process? So we, we wanted to look at this um, in some of the, the systems that we developed, and we um, and try to figure out what's happening to TDP. Um, we started to collaborate with uh, Shaimal Mosagalanti, who's an assistant professor at Life Science Institute, um, and uh, Amanda Irwin, who's a postdoctoral fellow in his group. And for this, we used a line of, of cells. Uh, these are human-induced pluripotent stem cells that have been modified by CRISPR um, in such a way that uh, we can actually uh, look at and track TDP43 in living cells. So the 
uh, we used CRISPR to fuse this multifunctional protein called halo tag to the amino terminus of TDP43. And this allows us to, to view TDP using these very photostable bright dyes that um, uh, covalently bind to halo tag via click chemistry. So this is um, really efficient uh, chemistry and very bright dyes. So it's uh, um, actually solves a lot of problems. So Elizabeth uh, Tank in our lab created these cells and then differentiated them into cortical neurons. And the first thing we did was just to check the um, fidelity of TDP tagging using these dyes. And in general, um, uh, you know, when we compare the, uh, the halo tag TDP using these dyes to um, TDP as detected by immunostaining, we see a very close overlap. So I think that these dyes are a this is a good way to visualize TDP and we don't actually need to use antibodies anymore, um, which has a lot of benefits of its own. So one of the, the first experiments that um, uh, that Amanda did, um, oh, sorry, I just, Mercy, I will I will answer your question uh, soon. So Mercy asked about the, the methylation experiments. Um, all of our tissue were from male donors and, and that's true. Um, this is a, uh, I don't expect that we'd see a difference in females, but it's a it's a good point. Um, in a lot of uh, previous studies where people have done trans transcriptomics in ALS, there are big differences between male and female. And um, what that does is it it really reduces the statistical power when you don't have a lot of samples. So we try to make them as uniform as possible, but but then we, uh, lose out on generalizability, right? So we don't we don't have tissues from females. But I will say in the in the um, immunostain samples, those came from males and females. All right. So um, right, one of the first experiments that, that Amanda did was to culture these um, halo tag TDP neurons, and then dump RNA on the cells. So really, kind of a um, mm, a gross experiment. I don't want to say gross, but um, not a very con you know fine-tuned experiment. We used uh, GU6, uh, which is just GU repeats, and and we did that because uh, we know that TDP binds with very high affinity to GU repeats. Um, but when we added the TDP to these cells, what we saw was that um, we got this mislocalization of TDP. So it goes from being nuclear to um, all these little dots appearing outside of the nucleus. And the, the first question that we had was, what, what are those dots, right? What do they actually represent? So um, first we did some high resolution confocal microscopy. Um, this is uh, the TDP, um, what happens to TDP when you add the RNA to these neurons. And you can tell that it's, you know, this is the nucleus up here and TDP is no longer in the nucleus. Um, and when we um, zoom in a little bit more detail and look at some other markers of intracellular organelles, um, like lysosomes and, and autophagosomes um, in, in uh, a red and yellow respectively, we can see that the TDP in many cases overlaps partially um, with uh, those organelles, but not fully, right? So there's some in, in lysosomes and some in autophagosomes, and there's a whole lot of TDP outside of those structures. So I think what we needed was a little bit more detail. Um, and that this is where Shymal and, and Amanda really came in. So what, what we wanted to do was cryo-electron microscopy to get some actual structural information on these mislocalized TDP deposits. Um, but it's not easy to do that. Um, most people who do cryo-EM use purified or recombinant protein, um, or um, they use cultured cell lines like HEKs or HELAs because they can survive the, the process used to, to generate the, the cell. So um, Amanda was able to get this to work. It took a considerable amount of time, but uh, she was able to grow um, I-neurons, these human iPSC-derived uh, neurons, on directly on EM grids, and then do uh, something called focused ion beam milling. And so here you're actually shooting an ion beam at these cells and um, you're, what we're doing is we're just 
uh, essentially um, uh, slicing it like a, a deli slicer so that we get a very thin lamella or a sheet that you're seeing right here on face that we can then um, image by uh, cryo EM and um, create uh, a tilt series. And that's what this looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like. So this is an axon of one of these iPSC derived neurons that uh, has undergone um, fib milling. And you can see these beautiful microtubule structures and these little dots are uh, a microtubule binding protein um, that you can see just sitting along the, the axis of the microtubule. So just incredible structural information on um, the neurons and, and their different processes. But we wanted to apply this to um, our human neurons that were um, in which we saw TEP mislocalization. So I, I, I really like this picture because it reminds me of the surface of the moon. Um, and you, you even have the little crosshairs, like, you know, you're, you're uh, looking at the moon from the, the, uh, the orbital lander or something like that. Anyway, um, when we add RNA, so here the RNA is labeled in magenta and the TDP is green. And this is a cell body, and you can really see that the TDP has just gone from the nucleus, and it's present. It, it's outside in the soma, um, and um, in these little roads between soma. These are the, the axonal processes. These little pink thing, or sorry, these cyan um, uh, dots are actual fluorescent beads, which we use to correlate um, the uh, electron microscopy grids to uh, fluorescent. Um, imaging, right? The confocal fluorescence signal. So to to go through that that workflow that that uh, Amanda and Shimal developed, we plate the neurons on the grids, map them out, choose a cell, and then um, do some uh, fib milling. And then uh, the beauty is we can then correlate using those beads to the confocal fluorescence microscopy using correlative light. Uh, electron microscopy or cryoclem. This allows us to pick out individual deposits <clears throat> that we see in these neurons and then subject them to um, electron microscopy. And I'm going to, in the next few slides, I'm going to show a couple examples of those structures that come from the cytosol. So this is what one that I call a, a small deposit. It's one of the um, I think it's one of the deposits that don't overlap with any of the, the organelle markers like the LC3 or the um, um, LAMP1, the autophagosome or lysosome. And you'll see through this tilt series that there's this sort of fuzzy thing in, in the middle, um, which uh, is where the majority of the TDP43 signal comes from. So this is a, um, a segmentation of the signal based on the, the structural characteristics of some of those organelles, um, we can pick out these popcorn-like things, which happen to be ribosomes. Um, you have these microtubules and um, little threads of the ER. And here there's this fuzzy thing that actively excluded other organelles. So um, it, it doesn't have a structure that we can pick up by electron microscopy. And, that probably that kind of makes sense because I, I think very often when TDP leaves the nucleus, it forms condensates um, or these phase separated structures. And because they're fairly dynamic, I, I would not expect the TDP to assume some sort of static structure that we could pick up on EM. So I think this is a, a phase separated um, condensate within the cytosol. But you can, the cool thing is very often these are adjacent um, to organelles. Um, such as the lysosome. And when we started to look further and image some of these other deposits that were perhaps a little bit larger, we saw some pretty interesting things. So um, in this case, we're seeing this double membrane bound uh, structure right here that has a lot of that uh, fluorescent signal that corresponds to TDP43 um, within the lumen. And, and when uh, start to look in more detail at these structures, you can actually see these little electron-dense fibrils um, that are forming within these structures. That we think are TDP, again, based on the CLEM signal. We're now um, doing some immunogold um, labeling just to confirm that um, we can get uh, uh, you know specific uh, 
uh, detection using TDP antibodies. But uh, based on the CLEM, what we see are these fibrils of TDP that accumulate within these structures. This, I have to say, these large accumulations within autophagosomes, uh, this is rare. And most of the, the structures that we see um, look a little bit different. So not quite so many fibrils. Um, and you can see them here, see these like thread-like things within this um, bottom left structure. Um, they are forming within lysosomes, as far as we can tell based on the, the cryo-EM. And that I, I think is really fascinating because we know that at least when you look at recombinant TDP43, um, it has very different properties in acidic environments uh, than it does at, at neutral pH. So we we actually, we don't know, I, I can't tell you for sure what is going on, but what I think is happening is that uh, these condensates are, are forming um, within the cytosol once, they're, uh, once the TEP is forced out of the nucleus. Um, and then they are somehow transported through an unknown adapter into autophagosomes and uh, lysosomes. And there the, the low pH or maybe even a, a cleavage event uh, triggers um, the formation of these uh, fibrils. Now, the cool thing, um, well, not the cool thing, one very cool thing about cryo-EM is that if you have enough data, um, you can start to average these structures and um, really get as much three-dimensional information as you can, high-resolution three-dimensional information. And so Matthew and Shaimal's lab has been trying to extract as many um, of these fibrils as he can and align them up to, to get down to a higher resolution structure. And, you know, we, uh, he spent hours and hours on this. And, and I think we're down to the point where we have this little red glob, um, which is good. Um, but what we want to do is get enough of these fibrils to get uh, detailed to the level of the individual amino acid. So we can actually look at the, the sequence and of these um, um, fibrils in the protein that makes it up. But we don't have that yet. What we do have is an overlay of um, TDP43 fibrils that were isolated from the brains of people with uh, frontotemporal dementia and TDP pathology. Um, and you can see that this structure actually overlays pretty well. I'm not a um, electron microscopist, right? I, I was told that this is not bad. Um, we tried overlaying some other structures like keratin or, or actin, and um, it doesn't look anywhere near as close of a fit as this. So I don't, I don't think we're there yet, but at least there's a hint that if we do something relatively simple, like add RNA to um, a cultured neuron, we see TDP mislocalization, and you actually see the formation of these fibrils that have many of the same structural properties as fibrils isolated from the brains of people with um, FTD. So that's a good indication that RNA misprocessing might actually be an important factor in triggering TDP pathology. All right, so this is sort of the beginning of, um, uh, I don't know, a, a really interesting project. Um, and there's still a lot to do. Irving, did you uh, give a hand up? Yeah, I wanted to ask you before you move on from this topic. Uh, when you purif when people purify and you purify these fibrils from from brains or you know or you have it even in culture uh, producing in the culture, the use do you have you subject to identify any associated proteins with with TDP forty three in the aggregates? Do you know of any proteins that are co-aggregates with TDP-43? So um, we we have tried, we're, we're isolating some of the insoluble fibrils ourselves. And, and I have to say, if we use, uh, it's a little controversial, right? Because uh, there's a paper that showed that cryo-EM structure TDP and somebody else tried to do it and they came up with a protein called TMEM-106B, right? Which happens to be insoluble in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases and even in aged brains. Mm. So uh, but if 
they were able to confirm it by by amino EM and amino gold that they have TDP and the amino acid sequence corresponds to TDP. So I I fully believe that um, Ben uh, Falcon's group was able to get TDP just with slight variations of the protocol. And when they started to look at more brains, they saw that there were these uh, gaps or, or um, little parts of the structure that were um, not filled in by TDP, but yet were, were there was definitely something there. And so that's where that's probably an associated protein that, that is incorporated into the fibril or some sort of macromolecule, right? It could be RNA. It could be DNA. It could be lipid. We we don't we don't really know, but but um I think it's that's that's an area that that we need to spend more time on. I'll bet TMEM one hundred six B is is one thing, but but I'm sure there are the others. Well, we will be happy to help you. You have those preps. We can subject to mass spec proteomics and uh, yeah. let you let you know. But because the same mistake has been was done with tau, people do sarcosyl insoluble tau. And they were immediately, uh, people to today can tell you that that is pure tau. You know, you have only tau there. And that is not, you know, I can tell you for sure that that is yeah. not the case. You have, yeah. you have tau <laughs> with many proteins associated uh, in that aggregates. Right. That co-purify, but also that co-aggregate with tau. And I saw that you have TA1 in your list of That's right. genes. Yeah, and one have been shown to actually uh, modulate uh, uh, tau aggregation. That's well. right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and yeah, that's Ben Willosen stuff, I think. And if and if you, but the interesting, so tau is a uh, is really interesting too for a lot of reasons because in FTD, right, the forty five percent of people with FTD have tau pathology, and like TIA one modulates tau pathology, but if you mutate TAIA1, you end up with TDP pathology, right? Same thing with VCP. You go one direction, you get TDP, you go the other direction, you get tau. So the the I think, you know, the, it makes sense that FTD has these two pathologic arms, and we don't nece necessarily understand all the interactions, but um, your point is a good one. And, and I think that we... In these fibrils, we focus specifically on on these preps. We focus specifically on the fibrils that we can see by cryo EM, and if you align them, they're TDP. But that says nothing about everything else that comes down in the prep. Yeah. All right. So um, I see this as like a, a you know beginning of a, a project or you know like a kid in a candy store. Right. There's so much work to be done right now. Um, we we just did this with a single RNA molecule, GU, 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 right? Um, and so, what about the length of the RNA? Does that matter? Can you can you get different structures if you use different sequence of RNAs? Um, space out the motifs. Uh, can you get other RNA binding proteins to to form structures, pathologic structures, if you use the motif that's specific to that RNA binding protein? Um, what happens if you do these peritranscriptional modifications like methylation um, or pseudouridinylation, right? There's there's lots of really, um, I think, fascinating questions um, that go that you can pursue. And one that that really um, comes to my mind is like, what is going on with these accumulations, right? So we can show that just a few hours after RNA addition, you get these fibrils accumulating. But what happens if you remove the RNA? Is it reversible? Probably, but I, I, we don't know yet. Um, and then what's the fate of the TDP that um, is fibrilized within these structures, right? Is it degraded? Does it just stick around and accumulated? There's this pathway um, called secretory autophagy in which the, the uh, vesicles, if there's some contents that aren't being degraded, they can actually fuse with the plasma membrane and shove the stuff out into the extracellular space. So it could be getting rid of through a non-degradatory mechanism. Um, so there's le lots of really, and that could have very important implications, I think, for progression and spread of disease. All right. Um, so how do I, you know, this is one way in which I, I put this together, right? So you have a healthy cell, it has nuclear TDP, and then there's something that happens, right? Um, with age, or maybe it's some sort of exposure. 
um, that that triggers a modification to your RNA, like methylation, that somehow um, creates a bunch more substrates for TDP, and it leaves the nucleus, right? Because of that massive influx of of um, TDP substrates, and then there's like this this decision point. It's almost like a checkpoint. Um, where depending on whether or not that, that trigger is still present and depending on the activity of the, the cellular clearance mechanisms, um, that's what determines what, what happens next, right? So if, if this is a temporary trigger, but your clearance pathways, like your autophagy lysosomal pathway are, are still functioning, you can recover from that and do pretty well. I, you know, one example of this is head trauma, right? That is a timed, a limited trigger that we know is connected to TDP mislocalization, but, you know, you bang your head once, hopefully it's just once, and then you stop doing it and you give the system a chance to recover. But in the case of a, a persistent trigger, um, what happened, even if your clearance pathways are active, right? If that trigger is around, you're still going to get TDP mislocalization, no matter how quickly you chew it up. And you're going to end end up with a loss of function of TDP because there's no no TDP around this place. Um, and then on the other hand, if your clearance path mechanisms are inadequate, then uh, you're going to end up with that accumulation of the stuff within the cytosol. And one of these disease associated uh, aggregates or inclusions. So we we've been sort of thinking about this and how to use the information we have. Of course, there's a lot more to be done. But what about uh, you know if we could figure out the structure and and design a, a ligand that that fits within a pocket of that fibrillar TDP structure, which we see as an intermediate? Um, it's possible we could develop a biomarker, right, in which we can see TDP mislocalization. Um, it would be incredibly important to do this for the new any treatments that are coming out that are trying to impact TDP biology in any way, right? You want a, some sort of biomarker for TDP function or TDP misfolding. Um, there's also the possibility to influence it one way or the other, like stabilizers or, you know, uh, protex that are specifically targeting some of these misfolded forms of TDP. So I, I see this as a, a, a real opening uh, for um, modulating uh, these pathways and perhaps um, sort of pushing you more towards the restoration. Now, this also I thought was really fascinating because uh, a lot of our previous work um, focused on autophagy as this uh, very essential pathway that was connected with ALS and FTD. And so it just, you know, we weren't, I, I want to say we did these experiments in a completely um, open and unbiased manner. And when we saw TDP accumulating in autophagosomes, it was like, yay, you know, we know what to do with that. But um, it wasn't necessarily our plan. Um, but we've been studying autophagy in particular in ALS and FTD for many years. And that's because mutations in these ALS related, in these autophagy related genes are often, um, uh, can often lead to, to ALS and FTD among other conditions. Um, and it kind of raises some really uh, interesting questions about uh, whether and how neurons are, are susceptible to mutations in autophagy-related genes. And as a matter of fact, it, 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 can this explain why TDP accumulates? So say you have a little bit of mislocalization all your life. If you don't have active clearance mechanisms, you're going to be more likely to develop persistent deposits. So one of the um, a fellow in the laboratory who's now at Johns Hopkins and he has his own group is Jason Chua. He wanted to know why neurons are particularly susceptible to um, uh, autophagy related problems. And so um, what he did was to obtain a line of human iPSCs from um, the Allen Cell Institute in which uh, LC3, which is this um, fundamental uh, marker and substrate of autophagy is labeled with GFP. And then using these directed differentiation approaches, um, he created lots of different cell types, like forebrain neurons, motor neurons, astrocytes, myocytes. And then we just did simple experiment. Let's look at those, those structures, those autophagosomes using fluorescence microscopy. And, um, you know, if you just look at iPSCs versus these differentiated cell types, there's not a whole lot of interesting things that are going on. 
But then if you add taurine, which is a, a very strong inhibitor of mTOR and can typically upregulate autophagy, you see these double membrane bound, like little donut like structures in the iPSCs, in um, the motor neurons, and in the, the astrocytes, um, it, uh, suggesting that you're getting you know, effective stimulation of autophagy in these other structures, but not really these neurons. Even more impressive when you inhibit um, uh, the vesicular ATPase or the uh, method by which these autophagosomes are acidified with baflomycin, you get this massive accumulation of these structures in all cell types except neurons, um, except forebrain neurons, I should say. Motor neurons had a pretty good response. Um, and for any of you, uh, um, any of you that really are interested in gliobiology, I'm, I'm just going to exit the slideshow uh, because I think these astrocytes. I hide this slide, but maybe I shouldn't. Um, are like just fascinating, right? So these are little movies, and LC3 remember is a microtubule associated protein, right? And you can see that it's it looks very microtubule-y. Um, in the untreated astrocytes. But when you add baflomycin, like 100% of that stuff redistributes into these um, uh, autophagosomes. It's just remarkable how quickly and robustly these astrocytes respond. Um, and you don't see that in the other cell types. So I, I'd be really interested in you know, how, these, how these cells are different and how they regulate um, LC3 processing. But there's a lot of a lot of other things to do. So we uh, what what Jason did and Elizabeth um, in collaboration with uh, Matt Lungman, who's at the uh, Radiation Oncology, um, was to look at differential um, transcriptomic regulation of of autophagy. So we took um, uh, genetically identical cells that were originally fibroblasts. They were converted to stem cells reprogrammed into stem cells, and then differentiated into neurons. And then we compared rates of RNA synthesis and degradation using techniques that Matt's developed called BruSeq and BruChaseq. And I'm just going to sort of cut to the chase here. And we found lots of differences in autophagy-related genes um, uh, among these different cell types. And one that was really um, oppositely regulated in iPSCs and, and um, that were very reactive um, to autophagy simulation, I neurons that were not, was this protein called MTMR5. So MTMR5 is myotubulin related phosphatase 5. So it's a phosphatase that participates in the PI3 or uh, phosphatidylinositol signaling pathway. Um, it actually helps uh, remove a phosphate group from uh, PI35P2 um, to PI. Um, or PI phosphate. And then um, this is important because we would expect MTMR5 to be a negative regulator of autophagy um, because this complex PI35P2 uh, is what sort of um, is important for the beginning of autophagy induction and in the phago 4 membrane elongation. And in neurons, we see a lot more MTMR5 as we would expect. And we see this in human neurons, but also in primary neurons um, at the RNA level and at the protein level. So it's a negative regulator and there's a lot more of it in neurons. So you would expect it to block autophagy. Um, and in fact, when Jason knocked it down, he saw that these cells became more um, sensitive to treatments that usually stimulate autophagy like taurine and restored um, sensitivity. On the other hand, if he upregulated MTMR5, um, it made cells less responsive to autophagy induction. So MTMR5 is both necessary and sufficient for uh, suppressing autophagy. And we, we didn't overexpress in this case, we used CRISPR-A, but same, same idea. So um, this is great, but this is just like GFP LC3, right? So we're looking at little dots. It's not really telling us how active autophagy is. And it just turns out that we had a great substrate for autophagy on hand, and, and that's TDP. So TDP is degraded by autophagy. We have seen this. A lot of other people have seen this. And 
we we have been we have the tools to to look at the the turnover of, of TDP. And and so we we did this using not halo tag. So in this case, we knocked in a protein called Dendro2, which is a green fluorescent protein. And um, it can be converted to red um, with blue light. So why is this? Why do we care about this? Um, aside the fact that it's kind of fun to um, make proteins change color, it's a really useful way to look at protein turnover. So in these cells, we um, illuminate with blue light, turned all that green protein red, and then stopped the blue light. And as you can see, the, the red signal drops and the green signal is coming back. And if we can measure the drop in the red signal, we can determine a half-life for the protein. If we can measure the green signal, you can determine a synthesis rate, right? So that that's what we did here. Um, and if you're if you're good, you can actually um, do this in a very quantitative fashion on a single cell level. It's very these experiments are really challenging though because the signal is not very bright, and there's a lot of variability, but but still very useful. So again, Elizabeth um, created this knock-in in human iPS cells and then converted these into neurons. Um, and then Nate Safran and, and Kate Westcamp, who have since moved on, did this, uh, these experiments where we can photo convert and get that red TDP dendro 2 signal. And then over time, you can see that red signal disappear as the, the green signal increases in intensity, right? So we can use this to calculate a half-life for TDP, which is about, mm, um, it's about somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. There's a lot of variability on the single cell level. Um, so um, this is in the absence of any treatment, but if we add ammonium chloride, which blocks autophagy, again, it alkalinizes um, lysosomes and autophagosomes, TDP is almost fully stabilized. And if you uh, block the proteasome in comparison, you get a partial stabilization. And that fits with what we know about TDP being both uh, autophagy and and uh, proteasome substrate. Uh, Sammy, one one question: Do you yeah. you had the dendra dendra two alone as a as a control yes. experiment? Yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. not I'm not showing those data, but we knocked in dendra two alone to use as a control. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's also degraded by autophagy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have seen that people use that control because of that. It, 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 yeah, yeah but the the half life is very different mm -hmm. than than TDP. Okay, good. All right, and then the the test was whether you know what happens if you knock down MTMR five, which is this candidate that that Jason identified. You enhance the turnover, so TDP gets turned over faster. That fits with what we think of MTMR five as a suppressor of autophagy. And that was completely blocked by ammonium chloride, suggesting that it that enhanced turnover is mediated by autophagy. In comparison, when if you try to add uh, bortezomib, uh, it has the same effect that it has without MTMR5. So it, I, I think that is independent of the effects of MTMR5. And then, um, you know, just to make sure that we're thinking about this correctly, MTMR5 works in complex with M MTMR2. And so we should see the same thing if we knock down MTMR2, and that, that's just what um, Jason saw. MTMR2 knocked down, enhanced the turnover, completely blocked by ammonium chloride, um, and MTMR9 knockdown had no effect. All right, so back to this model here. Um, I think that now we can, we can add a very small piece of, of this puzzle and, and say that at least in, in some cells, um, in neurons in particular, they may be more prone to developing uh, inclusions of TDP with uh, persistent mislocalization because autophagy is not as active. Um, but I don't necessarily, you know, I don't want to go off the deep end and say that, you know, we want to turn up autophagy in all cases, right? Because if you have very active clearance mechanisms in the absence of a trigger, you could end up with a, a loss of function uh, as well. And, and that would be just as bad, I think, as, as the mislocalization. So um, if anything, we need to figure out how to appropriately measure 
uh, autophagy before we think about trying to manipulate it. All right. Um, and just to, to acknowledge uh, the, the people who did the work, uh, I mentioned Elizabeth, um, who did most of the IPSC culturing and, and CRISPR modifications. Um, Mike McMillan and Nico um, did a lot of the work on the M6A. And uh, Jason uh, Chua, oh, Jason, where'd you go? Jason um, did all the work on MTMR5. Um, and Shaimal and, and Amanda um, uh, were responsible for most of the, the structural work. I'm, I'm happy to take any other, any questions that didn't pop up earlier. Hey, Sammy, that was really, really cool. Thank you for going through all that. Um, I'm also really interested in the dynamics of all of this. So it sounds like from what you were saying in the later part that just TDP being in the cytoplasm is enough to induce its degradation by autophagy. Is that correct? That that all TDP four that ends up there is is an autophagy substrate. And and do you have you ever seen any of those inclusion like structures or those fibrils, I, I should say, independent of autophagosomes? Is that a is that a state that targets them to autophagosomes, or do they develop once in the autophagosome and potentially disrupt? Yeah, I mean, I think we plus. see these. Um these guys, right? So if I were to, I don't want to go through this whole thing, um, but we see these, these like the fuzzy things that are outside um, of the, the autophagosomes or lysosomes, right? That we think are condensates. And I don't, I, I don't actually know how these are cleared. I think that, you know, given the limited information that we have, what I, the model that I have in my mind is that there, there's some sort of adapter protein that that will help shuttle TDP into lysosomes or autophagosomes for degradation, right? Maybe that's LAMP2, 2C, right? Maybe it's chaperone-mediated autophagy, and there's there's a little bit of data to suggest that's the case, but I, I'm not I'm not entirely convinced. Um, what we're trying to do right now is to find that adapter protein um, that is involved in in the clearance of TDP. Yeah. Well, it's a good question. I mean, what's to stop it from just going right back into the nucleus, right? Maybe some of it does. But you don't see any of those fibrils independent of being inside of a, an autophagosome yeah. or lysosome. That's right. The only place we see the fibrils is with an autophagosome or lysosome. And, and the cool thing is, um, I mean, most neuropathologists will be able to answer this much better than I, but when, when I've looked around the there's a lot of data showing overlap between LC3 and LAMP1 staining and TDP pathology. Um, so I think that there is some overlap. And then when you look at RNA, right, for as you would expect in like a stress granule or something like that, there's no RNA in, in TDP pathological deposits. So I, I tend to, to favor this model where it gets stuck in the autophagosome or lysosome, and that's what we see in postmortem tissue rather than like a stress granule or something, a cytosolic granule. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, great. Mercy said that was great. Thanks, Sammy. You are welcome. All right. If there aren't any other questions, I'm going to stop recording. We can still stay on for a little bit if there's any um, anything else.